Hello everyone. This time I want to talk a little bit about user interfaces. In particular, I want to talk about user interfaces for software. It's a huge topic and I can go on at great length uh, about user interfaces for anything under the sun. Uh, in fact, I did get that far off topic in the first attempt at recording this video. Um, but what I want to talk about isn't so much the general overarching user interface on any particular operating system or software. What I want to talk about is the uh, specific things that should be considered when building a user interface. And if you make any kind of software whatsoever, you have made a user interface at some point. Uh, most people associate a user interface with a fancy GUI thing uh, that you can point and click and fill in text boxes and things like that. But anything that allows a user of any sort to interact with your software is in fact a user interface. So on older computer systems, or ancient ones uh, by today's standards, the user interface was usually completely keyboard driven. Uh, usually it was commands typed on a keyboard that then the, the computer then went ahead and did something with. And that type of interface actually persists today and it exists even on your fancy Windows 10 uh, PC on your desk and it's even there behind the scenes on your Android phone and there's probably one behind the scenes on your iOS device if you have an iDevice somewhere. These interfaces tend to be used by the more advanced users. These, these are called command line interfaces and they tend to usually allow you to do anything that's possible on the device. You can usually do that with the command line interface. That's not always the case. Uh, witness the command interfaces for various versions of Windows, which are significantly crippled comparatively. On the other hand, you have your fancy GUIs, uh, your software that provides a graphical interface and it provides you a bunch of widgets that you can turn on and off and put text in and so on. Now, the advantage of these GUI interfaces is they allow you to um, discover options that are there, uh, at least options that have been exposed by the GUI. It also allows you to oftentimes interact with the software in a more natural manner. For instance, a web page with a bunch of links on it point to other things and so on is much more naturally uh, navigated using some sort of a graphical interface than with a simple list of text and then if you want to follow a link you have to type it in somewhere or something like that. And even if you had a text interface that was like a full, uh, full screen interface and you could navigate from link to link, it still feels more natural to interact with the uh, web page or what have you with a pointer device of some kind, so you can just click on that thing that you want to follow. It, it feels more natural than pushing arrow keys to find, or whatever, to get to the link and then selecting it, to follow it, and so on. Now, you might be thinking that, say, a GUI is superior to a command line interface uh, for pretty much everything then. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And it's not necessarily the case that a particular application naturally works better with one or the other. Now, there are many things like web browsers that tend to work better in the GUI space or a what you see is what you get a text editing program or a desktop uh, publishing program. Oftentimes those work more conveniently in a graphical environment. Other things actually tend to work better in a command line environment. Things like uh, 
a more advanced configuration of systems, or if you have to do things remotely, uh, it can often work better with a command line environment. Uh, one of the chief advantages of doing things remotely through a command environment instead of a graphical interface is far less traffic has to go between you and the remote device to actually accomplish what you're trying to do. On the other hand, the command line interface tends to require that you know more about what you're doing before you can actually figure out what you, like how or what you can do. Now, there are con concerns that should be addressed for any kind of a user interface for any software that these apply uh, regardless of the uh, type of interface that you're going to use or even the kind of software. One of the important things is you need to identify what types of interactions people will need to have with your software. Often, figuring that out will identify what kind of an interface makes sense. For instance, a compiler that's used chiefly by programmers who are going to be working with text files and may in fact be doing a whole bunch of complicated stuff behind the scenes, that may work better with some sort of a command line interface. On the other hand, uh, a scheme for configuring the options for how uh, windows display on your desktop computer is almost certainly going to work better with some sort of a graphical interface. So what you're trying to accomplish will in fact inform the type of interface that you need to create. But in, in many cases it doesn't really matter. Uh, you could provide a command line interface, or you could provide a full screen text interface, or you, a, you could provide a GUI interface, and all of that would be roughly equivalent. Uh, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. So what you need to identify is what aspects of the software are likely to be needed in various environments. You might provide multiple different interfaces for different environments if you expect your software to be used in multiple environments. In fact, depending on the software itself, you might actually build your core software with a command line interface and then add an extra program that serves as a graphical interface to that lower level command line program. And that's actually more common than you might think. A lot of the major things that you see on your screen uh, when you're messing about with your uh, computer or your, your operating system or whatever, you know, when you're configuring things or whatever, a lot of that stuff is actually a shim over top of a lower level scheme that uses configuration files and command line interfaces and so on to uh, make things happen. Now, regardless of the specifics of the uh, interface, like what type, you have to consider carefully what you expose and how you expose it. Now, by expose, I mean make it available in that particular interface. Just because your low-level program, the command line uh, interface program, uh, supports 700 options that you can pass to it, that doesn't mean that all 700 options have to be prominently present immediately on the uh, interface you provide, whether it's a full screen text interface or, or a GUI or something like that. You need to identify the bits that are likely to be used the most, and those should get the more prominent billing. But that doesn't mean you should leave out the more obscure options. Uh, having a way to find them is useful. Even if it's inconvenient in the GUI to get to them, having them in there makes them discoverable. And that's an important aspect of user interfaces. Uh, good ones will make the various features of your uh, software discoverable by someone who's noodling around in there. 
instead of making it completely hidden so you have to find some obscure switch somewhere to turn it on so you can actually access it. That said, that doesn't mean that you have to expose absolutely every widget tweak thing that your software supports. There will be some things that are only applicable to the software developer for debugging purposes, for instance, or for troubleshooting purposes, things that are not normally going to be needed at all. And it's perfectly fine to leave those out of the GUI or need some sort of a magic invocation to get them, uh, like some sort of a magic button sequence or something like that. But anything that the user might conceivably wish to tweak or modify or switch around should be in the GUI or the text scheme or whatever scheme you have. If it's not, then you've artificially hamstrung a large number of your users. And this is the trend that I've been seeing with a lot of uh, desktop environments and so on lately. And that is that instead of uh, moving a lesser used option into an advanced page somewhere in uh, a settings dialog, for instance, they just remove the setting entirely and make it impossible to set through the, through the GUI. And that's going a little bit far. You can have as much advanced setting options as you want hidden behind a, a Here Be Dragons Advanced button or something like that without impairing the general usability of your software where, with your simple settings page having the commonly used options. Now, this doesn't just apply to settings pages. Uh, something I've noticed is that a lot of things like graphics editors or uh, text editors, um, word processing packages, that sort of thing, tend to, by default, come up with about 100,000 options scattered all over the place, and it's a really busy display. And if you don't know what you're doing already, it's really hard to even figure out what's important or not. Uh, do you really need to know about these fancy kerning options that are up there front and center on this toolbar up on the top right or something like that? And when you, you get to that stuff, you start, you start getting overwhelmed and then it's no wonder that people tend to uh, shut down when they encounter software. Uh, it's because oftentimes the interface is too busy and you can't find anything unless you know what's already there. Uh, graphics editing programs are notoriously bad for this because they tend to uh, default to having pretty much every tool right there in your face instead of giving you a nice simple uh, canvas or something that you start out with that you, and then you dig up the tools that you need. Now, obviously, if the software is for something that you don't actually uh, have any way of figuring out how to do without actually knowing what it is, or knowing something about the task, then you're going to inform what is logical to have there automatically by what a reasonably competent uh, practitioner of the field is going to expect. So, for instance, a video, a nonlinear video editing uh, program is likely going to have some sort of a timeline and some, uh, some number of tracks or something like that. And it's going to have some sort of a preview video window or, and, and things like that. A list of available assets, uh, that sort of thing. And then it's going to have some controls for adding assets and setting up filters and so on. And that makes sense. Um, and most of the ones I've encountered are approximately that way, and you can generally make heads and tails out of them. At least if you have some idea what you're doing. A few, though, tend to make things far more complicated than they need to be. And that is a common 
complaint. Now, Microsoft obviously recognized this at some point when they brought out their ribbon interface, which substantially reduced the clutter in the user interface for their most of their software. Now, the problem with the ribbon interface, I think, is that it goes a little bit too far and that it removes just a little bit too much from obvious immediate discoverability. But it doesn't completely remove the ability to find these, these options, and that's an important distinction. Those menus and so on are still there. They're just hidden behind another click to get to them, and it's... Uh, it's not clear that it's necessarily a poor design decision. It's just that uh, some of what they've chosen to expose by default may be less than ideal, uh, or it may be less things than maybe they should have. But still, it re reduces the visual clutter, and that actually is a generally good idea. Now, that doesn't mean I happen to like the ribbon uh, scheme. I don't. Uh, and that's a personal preference. Uh, but I can't say that it's totally non-functional or that it's a really stupid uh, choice. Uh, it does, in fact, work. And as long as the settings in, and things that you need to find are in there, then it's generally okay from the perspective of this point. So that's an important thing. If you're building an interface of any kind, you need to consider what are the important tasks that people are going to be doing with your software? Like, what's the primary purpose of it? Don't obscure that with your interface. That, that's a key point. So, like, with uh, Word, Microsoft Word, uh, with the ribbon interface, you've got your, your editing canvas right there front and center. So it's pretty clear. Uh, where the thing that you, you need to operate on is. And even with their previous cluttered interfaces, it's still the canvas was the big chunk of the screen. Uh, so that made sense. You also need to make sure that the common functions that people are going to use are at least discoverable reasonably quickly. And it's also good to make sure that, that uh, you don't have too much stuff there. And given that for a non-trivial software package that has not a non-trivial number of operational modes and things you might do, like a word processing package, uh, you might want to make your basic interface configurable so that people that are using, uh, I don't know, uh, tables all the time can put that in their shortcut bar or whatever, whereas people that never touch a table in their life can leave that off of there and put something they do use. And, you know, just to be clear, this applies to, say, full-screen text interfaces, too. Uh, now, obviously, you should make sure that your interface, whatever style of interface you're using, the specifics of it are tailored to that style as well. So, for instance, a full-screen text interface meant to be navigated with a keyboard has different requirements than a full-screen graphical interface designed to be navigated with a mouse, which then has slightly different requirements to one that's intended to be navigated with a touchscreen interface. And it's important to keep those aspects in mind as well. And remember that you can't necessarily cater to all people with one interface. In fact, that's one of the problems that uh, operating systems over the past half decade or so have tended to run into. Uh, there's been this move to try and unify the user interfaces across all device classes, and that has blown up in the face of uh, operating system purveyors. And that includes Microsoft and uh, certain Linux distributions and so on. And by uh, trying to uh, take this newfangled touchscreen interface that uh, has been designed for things like tablets and phones and so on, 
and trying to shoehorn that into the desktop situation with a mouse and a keyboard is kind of um, self-defeating. Now, it may not have been obvious to the people to the uh, people making the decisions at the time, but the actual method of interaction with a desktop computer with a keyboard and a mouse is slightly different to the method of interaction with a touchscreen device. And that means that the design decisions that work really well on a touchscreen device work a lot less well on a desktop machine that may have a, a large monitor and a proper keyboard. So you don't want to uh, necessarily lock uh, the touchscreen interface in for your desktop computers. Some people might find that perfectly fine, but uh, there's a reason that the desktop interface, the classic interface with icons and start menus and, and mouse pointers and so on, uh, has persisted as long as it has, and that's because it works pretty well uh, for the desktop interface. It definitely doesn't work particularly uh, ideally for a touchscreen interface, and that's why these touchscreen interfaces have come along. So that's import an important consideration, is that uh, if your software is intended to be used in multiple use cases on multiple classes of devices, you need to think carefully about whether you need to have multiple different interfaces for it or if depending on your particular uh, circumstances maybe you can get away with a single interface for all of them but that's enough on, on that part of it uh, I want to talk just a little bit about the importance of a user interface just in general for your software uh, and and this, is, this is independent of any particular type of interface. You have to remember that the user interface is the part of your software that your users see. That's how they interact with the software. So you need to make sure that user interface is functional. That it does what it purports to do. Uh, if it says that clicking a button will save something, it better save it. If, if, it, um, if it has a navigation off somewhere uh, to, to do some task, there better be a way to get back from that somewhere, either before the task is started, you know, because it, you don't want to do it anymore, or after the task is done. Uh, you need to avoid those dead-end interactions where you get somewhere and then you can't, can't get back out. Uh, for instance, there's at least one version of the Netflix app where you get into a menu somewhere to adjust some settings and it is impossible to get back out to the main Netflix app. Uh, that's a dead-end navigation and that is a serious fault in the user interface for that particular Netflix app. And this is the sort of thing that you need to pay close attention to. In fact, a less than optimal user interface is much more tolerable than an interface that actually traps users or actively prevents them from getting anything done or makes them have to think hard to get back to where they came from. So that's an important factor. So a lot of times interfaces get that afterthought um, vibe about them. The uh, people making the software went, okay, we got the functionality working, now we just need some way to actually use it. Okay, bam, here's an interface. So they spend hundreds or thousands of hours, of man hours, attempting to build their, uh, their latest um, killer app for whatever, and then they spend all of 10 minutes designing an interface for it. And if you do that, you're messing with, with your chances of success. And I see this in commercial software all the time, especially niche type software, where it's clear that 
nobody with a clue about what the users were actually going to do with the software was at all involved in designing the interface. Instead, the interface was designed around how the programmers of the software think. And as a result, if you don't understand how software is implemented, you can't figure out how the interface works. So this is an important point. The user interface is the part of your software that your users see. And if that doesn't work well, then your users are going to get pissed off, they're going to curse your name, they're, they're going to tell all their buddies that your software sucks. It doesn't matter that you can do anything under the sun from uh, you know, getting your uh, head shrunk to uh, solving the towers of Hanoi in your software if the user interface is bloody awful. And I'm looking at you, Emacs. The interface is bloody awful. Um, so it's an important uh, thing to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, put some thought into your user interface, even before you start building your software, because how your user interface needs to function to be usable to the users may in fact affect how you build your software. And if you've built your software first, now you, you might find yourself fighting a massive impedance mismatch to give the users something that they can actually use. And here's a metric that you can apply to your user interface. If it requires three weeks of intensive training to even do basic tasks with your software, you have failed with your user interface. Um, if that intensive training is learning how the uh, whole industry your software applies to works, that's a different story. But if you need that two or three weeks of intensive training and actually using your software specifically for someone who already knows the uh, terminology and stuff involved in the industry, then you have failed as a software developer because it means your interface is horribly inadequate. Now, requiring some advanced tuition to figure out really advanced features of your software, that's reasonable. But if the really basic purpose of the software cannot be accomplished with a relatively quick introduction to how the software works, your user interface has failed. And I see this all the time in really expensive software. It's like the um, more obscure the interface is, the more valuable the software is because people think, oh, I had to spend weeks learning how to use it. It must be excellent software. Well, maybe it is. But there's no need for a user interface to be excessively complicated. Move the advanced options to a separate panel somewhere, maybe. Or think about the workflows people use and give interfaces for doing those workflows. And this is usually where things break down, is the actual workflows people want to do aren't well supported, while a whole bunch of extraneous stuff that maybe you want to do once in a blue moon is all there front and center. And that goes back to other points that I've made, where you need to make sure that the things that people want to do are clear and unobstructed. Right, anyway, uh, user interfaces, they're a really important part of software design and they're unfortunately massively overlooked. So if you are developing a software project, do make sure to put some real heavy thought into the actual interface before you actually start slinging code and making complex designs for the actual guts of the software. After all, if you can't figure out a usable interface, there's no point making the rest of the software if you can't make it usable. Uh, and it might tell you that maybe you're not really onto something that's worth doing. On the other hand, if you can think of an interface that works, have at it. Anyway, 
that's enough on this topic for, for today. Um, be sure to subscribe to be notified of future videos. And if you've managed to watch this far, thanks for watching.